Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Wilton Library. I'm Michael Bellicosa. I'm the head of adult programming here, and I'm also the curator of the Brubeck Collection, which is Dave Brubeck's personal archive. It's one of the largest, most important jazz archives in the world, and we have it here at the Wilton Library. So, yeah. I, I love showing off some of the amazing things in that collection. We've got thousands of photographs, hundreds of personal recordings of Dave's, of his performances. Uh, so if you want to come for a visit, just give me a call. We do it mostly by appointment, but I'm pretty flexible. So give me a call. Come on over for a visit. It's, it's a, it's a, the collection is just simply unbelievable. So as we get started, we're making a recording of this. So please turn off your phones and devices. And I'll just give you a quick program note. Most of you probably know this already, but for those who you don't, this is the first of four programs in a series about this unbelievable year, 1959, when some of the most seminal jazz records of all time came out within 12 months of each other. Uh, on April 10, we will be covering Dave's uh, Time Out record. And then on May 22, we'll be covering Coltrane's Giant Steps. And then on June 18, uh, we'll have the capstone that sort of brings it all together, and that's June 18. It was originally scheduled the 19th, but that's June 10th, so we moved it up one day, so June 18th. You have to sign up for each one individually. That's how we set up the registration. Uh, tonight, we're going to feature Kind of Blue by Miles Davis. We all know it's one of the most iconic albums of all time in jazz genre, and we're very fortunate to have with us uh, my friend Gil Harrell. Uh, a brilliant musicologist and educator who has given us many fantastic programs here over the years. Gill's got a PhD from Brandeis. He's a musicologist and a composer whose interests include styles ranging from Western art music to contemporary musical theater. Previously he served on the faculty at CUNY Baruch College where he was awarded the prestigious Presidential Excellence Award for Distinguished Teaching. And currently, he's a full professor of music at Connecticut State, Naugatuck Valley, where he has been presented with the AFT Merit Award for exemplary service to the college for six consecutive years. In 2020, he was honored with the coveted Connecticut Board of Regents Teaching Award at Naugatuck Valley. Gill conducts the College Chorale, the a cappella ensemble. He teaches music history and theory, and he serves as musical director of theater productions. So please join me in welcoming back to the Brubeck Room for the first time in a number of years, live and in person, Dr. Gil Harrell. Check one, two. Thank you so much, Michael, for that introduction. Thank you, folks, for joining me this evening. And I hope that you'll be joining for the subsequent installments in this series as we're considering music in the jazz literature from 1959, as Michael suggested one of the most important watersheds in the entire century, not just for jazz, but I would say for American music in general. Many of you might know this, but Duke Ellington famously referred to jazz as American classical music. And what he meant by that, and that's gonna be important for us as we consider music that was created in this year by these remarkable artists. What he meant is that jazz straddles this interesting line because certainly in the middle of the 20th century, jazz was a kind of popular music, that is to say, People from all walks of life, from all different cultures and demographics, uh, enjoyed this music and collected these albums and played them out so that they'd have to go and buy new records because the vinyl would get worn out because they played it with such uh, alacrity and frequency that uh, they would need to replace them. So that testifies to just how popular this music was. But the term popular music is a bit misleading, isn't it? At least the way we understand that word today. It's a bit anachronistic to refer to jazz from 70 years ago or 60 years ago as pop music or popular music, it straddles this interesting line because it had mass appeal, and yet jazz is fundamentally a style of music that requires a lot of training and a lot of chops, if you will, a lot of dexterity uh, to, to execute, to play it correctly. And when we talk about the musicians that are going to populate this lecture series, I mean, these folks were unbelievable, imaginative, creative, not only composers, but also performers who played with startling frequency. People now, of course, are touting someone like a Taylor Swift who goes out and does her concert for it. And that's impressive, and we might doff our caps to her. But this is nothing compared to what Miles Davis was doing in the 1950s, where he was either playing in his regular haunts in New York City or traveling around, and that could be in the Midwest, it could be the West Coast, 
It could be Canada, it could be Europe. All over the place, playing gig after gig after gig, and then being in the studio when he wasn't doing gig. Uh, the productivity and the prolific nature of musicians is almost impossible to overstate. Speaking of productivity and industriousness, our first program, of course, is going to come to the man who is on the screen right now, the famous jazz trumpeter, composer Miles Davis. Now, you can come up with any number of adjectives to describe Miles Davis. He lived from 1926 to 1991, and he was active for almost his entire career, starting as a teenager, with a, a, a brief window of about five years from 1975 to 1980, which, due to addiction and other issues, that was really the only fallow period of his entire life, his entire career, which again spanned some 50 years or so. And I was just chatting with Michael before the program began about how incredibly prolific he was. The album we're going to be talking about, Kind of Blue, which was recorded in the spring of 1969, was the fifth album that Miles Davis recorded with Columbia Records, which he had only signed with in 1957. This was his 25th or 26th album overall. And by the way, at the time that he recorded this album, he was in his early 30s. So to have recorded nearly, let's say, around 25 albums at this age uh, is, is a remarkable feathering of the cap. So we might come up with any number of adjectives to describe Miles Davis. And I'm going to share some anecdotes about Miles Davis, which will help us fill out our image of the man, the good, the bad, and perhaps a little bit of the ugly. But I would suggest to you, in the context of this lecture series, the one thing that we might focus on as we consider kind of blue, or as we make our way towards the spring of 19 build a bit of a ramp as we get there, is that Miles Davis was almost unbelievably, relentlessly innovative. So focused was he on innovation that it tended to be the case that Miles had a restlessness about him when he, when he discovered a new idea or when he pursued it. First of all, he would pursue it with a sort of indefatigable, never say no uh, attitude which led him to, to change his lineups and pursue musicians who perhaps he would not have considered working with prior to that. But then once he stumbled upon it, he was ready to move on to the next thing. So even though, as Michael mentioned in the opening remarks, Kind of Blue is, without a doubt, one of the most recognizable, iconic, not only jazz albums, but I would suggest one of the most iconic records of the 20th century in American music. But it's also worth pointing out that for Miles, this was a fairly ephemeral, transient phase for him. The magical formula that he created, along with the other five members of that famous sextet in the spring of 1959, Miles did not dally long there in that realm of the kind of blue style. And later on in his career, even years later in the 1960s, not long after kind of blue, which had been such a sensation, which had sold so well, such an overwhelming commercial success, where Miles was asked to play songs from Kind of Blue. Oh, Miles, they would say at the Cafe Bohemian. Play So What? And Miles, in his iconic way, would say, no, nah, that song makes my lips itch. <laughs> See, he wasn't interested in reinventing the wheel. As he said, when you play old standards and you kind of try to make albums that are based in a certain style that you've already pioneered and, and worked in, he likened it to eating leftovers. He calls it formed over turkey. His autobiography. By the way, since we're in a library, I should mention that if you haven't done so uh, and you're interested in the content we discuss in this program, check out there's any number of great books about Miles Davis, but probably the best place to start is Miles. That's the name of the book, an autobiography um, with Quincy Troop. And if you're interested in audiobooks, I don't know if the library has the audiobook of this, but it's a fantastic reading by a guy named Dion Brown. You must have studied Miles Davis' interviews and sounds very convincingly like him as he reads this autobiography. You might know about Miles Davis's voice that he had a very unique vocal timbre, very raspy, scratchy, whispery kind of voice. And that was due to an operation that he had in the 50s, a couple of years before Kind of Blue, where he had a, um, a benign growth removed from his, his larynx. And they told him afterwards, OK, you have to be on vocal rest for two weeks. Well, what do people do when you put them on vocal rest? Yap, yap, yap. And Miles later joked about it, uh, that he, he knew that he had badly damaged his voice because he wasn't following the doctor's orders. 
that's a just a little footnote. If you listen to the audio book, you'll hear Dion Graham reading from his poem like this, and it sounds just like my face. Um, it really does. It's, it's a very you know, he's a very gifted um, voice actor, as I said earlier. So it's a very compelling book. Probably um, you know something that one could read in a very short period of time. So if you're interested in what we discussed tonight, you know, make a U-turn when you get out of here uh, and and go look uh, rummage through the library and look for uh, look for Miles. There's other books I can recommend to you if you're interested. For each of the programs we're going to be doing in this series, I'm going to be recommending books to read, and I know that the library has them, so uh, you can pick them up. This is one-stop shopping, Michael. Uh, here. Oh, I came to lecture, then I got a great book. All right. I want to talk a little bit about where Miles Davis was in the mid-1950s and uh, how kind of this came to be. And then, of course, towards the middle of the program, we'll talk about the album itself. And I'm going to delve into a concept which some of you may have heard of, but it may be a sort of nebulous or abstract idea. How many have ever heard the term modal jazz? Yeah, okay, that's a, that's a good number of you. If you haven't heard it, and to discuss it, if you have heard it and wondered what the heck is it, well, I'm going to try to clarify what it is. I was telling Michael, uh, we were chatting before the program started, modal jazz is actually one of those things that is very easy, I think, to understand the basic idea behind it. Of course, it's very difficult to play in this style, um, but the, the premise is, is, I think, a very accessible one. So we're going to talk about modal jazz because Kind of Blue is considered the cornerstone example of modal jazz. It's not the first one. That actually, I think most jazz historians would probably point to a record from 1958 called Milestone, which some of you have listened to it many times. Uh, Milestone is one of those, um, that, one of the albums that really starts to pioneer the sound. And um, Miles had, had kind of experimented with this sound idea throughout 1958. In fact, he had scored a film, a, a French film. He had connections to Paris. And he had scored a film called Elevator to the Gallows. And when he was asked to score the film, he did not have time to write out an elaborate score. He was basically asked to watch scenes from the film, to look at images and tableaus, to come up with ideas, musical ideas, to record. That's a kind of a, one of those ideas that if you were to pitch it to musicians today, and say, hey, just look at a bunch of images and go into the studio and record it. And you don't have a chance to sit over a desk with your manuscript paper and revise it heavily. And Think about every note carefully. Most people would balk at the idea today, but of course, Miles Davis came along and created really terrific stuff with that with the score. I've never seen the movie, but I have listened to uh, the music from it, and it is in that modal jazz vein. So let's talk about Miles in the 1950s. Well, the good news for him on a personal level was that by the mid 50s, he had kicked his heroin habit. And of course, as many of you know, heroin was discouraging the jazz community. Many of the people that Miles played with, including some of the folks on the, uh, in that sextet that recorded Kind of Blue, were at some point heroin addicts. In fact, Miles probably would have liked to record this album with a guy named Philly Joe Jones on the drums, but he fired Philly Joe because Philly Joe was, as Miles described him, a dope queen. Um, John Coltrane had gotten clean by 1957, but when Miles and, and Coltrane were playing together in the mid 1950s, 55, Miles was in love with Coltrane's sound. He was blown away, but he had to fire it. Why? Because Coltrane was nodding off during their sets. He'd be on stage falling asleep. There's a famous story about Miles backstage at the Cafe Bohemia, I believe, and Coltrane was falling asleep. And in a previous set, they used to play what are called 40-20 sets, where they would come out at 20 minutes after the hour, and then they play a 40-minute set, and then they go back to the stage for another 20 minutes, and then come back 20 minutes after the next hour. So after they played their first set, Miles looks back and he sees Coltrane sort of falling asleep, standing up, because he's on heroin. And Miles, who had a fairly uh, cantankerous personality, that's putting it mildly, you read his autobiography again, he has no sense of the language he prefers. It is chock full of expletives, so if you're listening to the <laughs> audio book, just make sure there's no children around. And he sees uh, Coltrane, and he sees Coltrane nodding off backstage, so he slaps him upside the head as Miles does, and punches him in the stomach. Now, on this particular evening, Polonius Monk was visiting. He went backstage and witnessed this. And Monk said to Coltrane, he said, you know, with the way you play, you don't have to take that from Miles. You can come play with me. And that's exactly what Coltrane did after Miles fired him. <laughs> Later on, after Coltrane kicked his habit, Miles begged him to come back to the group. That's essentially what happened. 
Miles had been playing recording with a fairly um, limited in reach record label called Prestige Records. Prestige Records did not have the kind of reach that Miles would have liked. There is this myth in the jazz community that you know jazz is this insular art form that is only meant for people who uh, you really understand music. I, I don't think I've never met a jazz musician who actually would, would say that. This is a myth that is sometimes promulgated. It's totally fallacious. Miles wanted his music to be heard and appreciated. Prestige, A, didn't have that kind of reach and also wasn't paying him a lot of money. Why? Because he had signed a record uh, contract with him back in the early 50s when he was, by his own admission, a junkie. And so by the mid-1950s, in this time when he's playing with Coltrane and Philly Joe Jones and Red Garland, and then they bring on Paul Chambers in 1955, this amazing bassist, an imaginative soloist, used to bow his solo sometimes, and was regarded as one of the premier uh, players you'd want in your rhythm section. By that point, he's, he's starting to really take off. He's become really famous. And yet he still signed with what he perceived as, and I'm going to use a, a, a kind of anachronistic phrase that Miles would use, but this Brinky Dink record label that had treated him well in that it had signed him when he was in a very low position in his career, but also had not done anything recognize this DVR ascent that had taken place by 1955. So Miles is looking for new options and he decides to sign with Columbia Records. And I would say that signing with Columbia Records is a really important watershed in his career. That's an important milestone, if you will. <laughs> now, in terms of some of the sidemen I described, uh, I mentioned some of those names. I want to talk a little bit about the schedule. As I mentioned earlier, these guys were unbelievably prolific. Played at a frequency that would really beggar the imagination of most musicians today. They would play regularly, for example, in Manhattan, where Miles was living. Uh, eventually, he bought a, an apartment building on 10th Avenue and lived there by the late 1950s. Um, and, and so they'd play at, at these various clubs, where the Birdland or the, the Honest Club in Jersey, or as I mentioned earlier, uh, Cafe Bohemia. They'd play at these places. They went out to California, for example, San Francisco, they had their own sort of circuit that they would play in the Midwest, Chicago, or in Philadelphia, wherever they were, they had the circuit of places they would play. And they would very often go on tours. They would leave and pack up and go away for a month or however long it was and live out, out of a hotel while they played. Miles was able to, I think, recognize his own growing profile. So he was able to renegotiate a lot of the contractual details about his performances. For example, there's a story in 1957. Decides that he's worth more than the $1,250 that the band said he should release. By the way, $1,250 back then was a lot of money in the 1950s, in the 50s, but he decides it's more. So um, he, he says to Harold Lovett, who's kind of his lawyer slash manager, he says, tell him I'm not playing for anything less than $2,500. Imagine that you have a job and you say, well, I want to raise. Say, all right, how much are we talking here? 5%, 7%, no, 100%. <laughs> and he got it. And there's a story that he's in Philadelphia, he's playing a club, and, and he says to the owner, you know, well, I, you know, I want $2,500, and I'll take it for less. And the owner says, no. And Miles starts packing up his equipment. He says, all right, guys, we're going. And there's this line around the corner with people ready to come in. And the club owner says, okay, all right, well, let, let's chat. Okay, fine. And they paid him. Um, so he, he's got this rising profile. Again, he's playing with some of the best musicians that are on the scene on the East Coast scene. Of course, in our next program on April 10th, come back and hear about the West Coast scene. But on this East Coast scene, you know, in addition to John Coltrane and Billy Joe Jones, Billy Joe was famous for his rim shots, what they called the Billy Lick, that he just had this incisive sense of, of rhythm and how to access and playing against uh, soloists. Miles would later say that for trumpet players to set, especially, it's very important to have great drummers behind them. We point to examples, for example, Max Roach plays so well with Clifford Brown before Clifford Brown's tragic death. You know, Clifford Brown was this young guy, he had to be 25 or 26 when he died in a car crash. Um, and Max Roach was really, it, it was something that it took him a long time to emerge from that funk, that depression of losing this amazing collaborative trumpeter. Well, Miles had great, you know, phenomenal drummers, including Philly Joe Jones. And Philly Joe is a funny guy. You, stories about him in the jazz annals. I'll give you uh, two stories. 
One is that Miles is um, they're in Quebec, they're in Montreal, doing doing a circuit there, and they're supposed to fly back to New York. And Philly Philly Joe's run out of heroin. He's starting to get sick, and he's they they have gigs, and Philly Joe's you know in the middle of the set telling Miles Miles play a ballad. I got a few. <laughs> it sounds funny, but it's crazy to think about. And finally, they're supposed to fly back, and good thing they're both about to fly back because Philly Joe's going crazy. He's really sick. He's detoxing, and he needs to be fixed. And lo and behold, the night they're supposed to fly back, there's a snowstorm in New York. No flights going into New York. So now Philly Joe's really going nuts. He's, he's losing it. So he says to Miles, he says, I got a guy in Montreal. That I got to go get my stuff. I got to go get it. So Miles drives him to the dope dealer's house. Philly Joe, the first thing he does, he gets him into the dealer's bathroom and sleeps with him. This is like wearing on Miles. There's no patience for this. And then he buys a dope, and Miles has to pay for it, knowing that, that um, uh, you know, he's in this very seedy environment. And Miles had been a heroin addict, so he wants to distance himself from it. But he loves Philly Joe Jones' playing. If you're wondering why Philly Joe is not on the Kind of Blue album, now you know. Uh, you're going to hear Jimmy Cobb on the drums. And, um, the, after it, Miles gets up in Philly Joe's face and he says, if you ever make me do anything like this again, I, you know, we're done. And they've been very good friends. And Philly Joe says to Miles, Miles, why are you talking to me like that? I'm your brother, man. I'm your brother. And you know, Miles, if you shouldn't be mad at me. You should be mad at God because he put this snowstorm, man. It's not my fault, Miles. <laughs> I'm kind of imitating Deanne Graham, you know, in the audiobook. That's how he reads Philly Joe. And Miles says he, he, got, he was so angry. And then as soon as Philly Joe started with this explanation, Doubled over laughing, because you couldn't help but, but feel moved by this guy, how, how compelling a talker, how fast a talker he was. And so Miles has a famous quote about Philly Joe Jones. He says, if Billy Joe had been white and a lawyer, he would have been president. <laughs> <laughs> because to be president, you have to be white and a lawyer and full of shit. <laughs> I love that story. It tells us, one, how Miles was so close with these people he played with. And also how he could just go hot and cold very quickly. His basics, we're going to see Paul Chambers a little bit later on. And um, again, I mentioned one of, the, one of the great players of that era. Unfortunately, Paul Chambers died in his early 30s. Again, a combination of both drugs and alcohol. And there's a funny story about Paul Chambers. He was born in the mid-30s. I want to say he's about 10 years younger than Miles. So at this time when they're touring, Miles is just after his 30th birthday. So that means Paul Chambers in his early 20s. Paul's a big guy, handsome guy, they're out. And Paul's drinking these, these drinks called zombies. And Miles doesn't, in the book, doesn't say what they were in a zombie, but we can imagine some of the folks. And Miles says to Paul Chambers, why are you drinking that stuff? You know, we have to play a set you know, in, in a half hour. Why are you drinking it? And, and Paul says, oh, I can handle it, Miles. Don't worry about it. I can drink as much. It doesn't affect me. So Miles says, I'll tell you what, you can drink as many of those as you want, and I'll pay for it. So Chambers starts drinking you know, five or six in the last set. Afterwards, they go out to a spaghetti restaurant. And Paul Chambers says, you see, Miles? I told you I'm fine. Oh, Miles says, okay. And then Paul Chambers is dumping hot sauce on the spaghetti. So Miles is, he says, why are you dumping all that hot sauce? I like hot sauce, Miles. Leave me alone. All right. Miles turns to talk to Philly Joe. And then, bang, they hear this crashing sound. And Paul Chambers' face is pasta, uh, hot sauce and all. Miles, of course, just bawling, laughing hysterically. So I, I tell these stories uh, because they really cast, a, I think, a very human light on these musicians as they were pioneering this profession um, and, and spreading their music. You know, back then, there were records, and there were a lot of records, and these guys were prolific studio recording artists. But imagine getting to see them live. It's one of the great things about the Bluegrass archive is you've got this treasure trove of non-commercially released recordings of live performances that uh, were captured. And they have vanished into the dustbin of uh, history, perhaps, if not for custodians uh, who, who kept a watchful guard of this stuff and, and preserved it for posterity. So a very cool detail. All right, I want to get into some music. Um, I think we talked about most of the important figures. Drums we covered, right? We talked about Billy Joe Jones. To hear Jimmy Cobb on the record. Um, we'll talk about piano. Miles played with some of the great piano um, uh, you know, musicians, the sextet players, the quartet, the 
but I think that um, players, guys like Tommy Flanagan and Red Garland, and of course on the record you've got two pianists. Most of uh, the piano duties on Time of War were handled by Bill Evans, who was white, and that was somewhat controversial at the time. And I think it testifies uh, to a, a fact which disputes a, a, a widely held notion, or somewhat widely held notion. I don't know how widely held it is today, but people used to say that Miles Davis was racist somehow. Because he could be inflammatory and short-tempered, and he had running with the police and things like that. But uh, that's really malarkey. All right? And the notion that he's racist is, is just not true. You could make the argument that he's cantankerous, that he had a short temper, that he was an angry guy. You could even say that he was a misogynist. I think all those things are true. But racist, that's a hard point to make. And if you look at Bill Evans' inclusion in the sextet, that's a, a direct reflection of that. Miles loved Bill Evans' playing, and there's a very widely repeated anecdote about Miles falling in love with Bill's playing. And later generations of pianists would also remark about Bill Evans' touch. Bill Evans tragically died in 1968, having trouble with drugs. He kicked his heroin uh, habit thanks to methadone, but then he became addicted to cocaine and alcohol. Bad news, and he dies in 1980. But, but Miles was so enamored of Bill's playing that he would call Bill Evans and say, Bill, put the phone, put your phone on your piano. I just want to listen to your practice. This is sort of his signature practice because Miles Davis was such a virtuoso in playing through that medium. He was able to basically conjure up his own music. So we talked about um, Bill Evans. On one of the tracks, and we're going to listen to it if we have time, you're going to hear Whit Kelly playing. This number that we're going to listen to is called Freddie Wheeler, because it's written about a guy named Freddie who, believe it or not, was a massive freeloader. Or, um, I love the, the Yiddish word for freeloader, schnurrer. Big time schnurrer. And so they wrote this, this track, Freddie Wheeler. And basically, you have these accented hits from the horns, but most of it is, is really dominated by Whit Kelly's piano playing. So we'll listen to a little bit of that. These tracks, by the way, are quite long. And that tells us that we're out of the era, well out of the era, where you know, those limited, uh, what are they, those 38 RPM records, where the tracks, if you go back and listen to music from the 1920s, 30s, that era, 40s even, the tracks are like 3 minutes and 14 seconds max, because that was what fit on one side of the 38 RPM record. 78, whatever, I think that's a 70 RPM. So now when we get to the 1950s, they're able to ex explore and expand, and, and um, as Miles would, would say, stretch out. That's the language of the jazz parlance, is to stretch out and engage in these long form improvisatory passages. That's especially important with Kind of Blue because so much of the album is bound up with improvisation. We'll talk about why that is. Right. Here's a track from, this is from 1958. Miles is now working with, um, with Columbia Records. And this is regarded as first exploration of modal music. Now, I'm going to talk more about it when we get to kind of blue, and I'll demonstrate a few things from the piano, but when we talk about modal music, what we're often talking about is instead of fast key changes or rapid vacillations between different chords, instead, you get entrenched in one sort of sound which is rooted in a particular note or tone, but has a lot of options, a lot of possibilities, a lot of permutations and combinations available above it. The form here is a, a form that really vacillates between the 16 bars of what we call the Dorian mode and the 8 bars of Nicolino mode that he bars uh, back in the Dorian mode. So let's see if we can hear that, this idea that music is basically rooted in only a couple of different uh, harmonic patterns. Dominant tone. There's other notes above it, of course, there's harmony, but a lot of it sort of floats above that tone on the bottom.
dominant tone, even over all of these notes that Coltrane's playing here, we really hear that A all the way on the bottom. the differences in modal jazz versus the jazz that had predominated in the decades prior is to consider the antecedents to this period, which could, for example, include uh, bebop or post-bop, and think about how jazz charts were arranged. So, move over to the piano, and I'm going to demonstrate a few aspects of how modal jazz works. Coltrane, when he was playing piano, he was playing the basic Playing a three or four step show in a nightclub, and no one's going to practice. And the famous story about the monk who tied up his four steps, and nobody bothered him to practice it. Right? And that's what we're going to talk about. Anyway, we're going to talk more about modal jazz uh, later. Right now, this is just a kind of a general listening to modal jazz, but we can have other tools, but also we can talk about the guys that. Traditionally, when jazz performers, we go back to the Bach era, we talk about the quartet uh, and the Bach tradition of the first performers of the style, and that's the Dr. Bach, the Bach, the Bach, the Bach, the Bach, is to define the style of the classical besides the major high and low. And you can do that in the Bach style.
any left of us, we'd ask that your wife should be free of the Lord of all the world. Let's take the Lord together. Let's say our hands upon our belly as we open our mouths and begin to sing the Lord's name. chosen them.
doesn't matter what these compositions are, as long as you're picking from those particular notes, you can do a majority of both. I'm just an example. Here's D. We'll play above it this combination.
Later on, Igor Stravinsky would write a chord in 1912 that sounded like this. You heard it comes up on the ballet, and you get. Right? That's the, well, what do you call it? The right of spring chord. Well, guess what we call this one? The so what chord. <laughs> Notice when Miles starts his solo, he starts like this. Well, it's such a famous beginning to a solo. And right when you land, Jimmy Cobb gives this fantastic crash solo. The story goes that Jimmy Cobb was very worried that he might crash the solo because the start was too loud. Thank you. 
was playing almost behind the beat with me. That's such a hard thing to do on purpose. He's counting one, two, three, four. You can hear him. Da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. It's not. Da, 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 da. It's so hard to do that. Turning 40 tomorrow, so. Oh, wow. So as I dance around the piano, I feel I'm still especially sprightly tonight. I'll say about Coltrane is that Miles was generally speaking not a fan of saxophone players who he thought played too much what he called above the texture of the music. What he meant by that was it was sort of pyrotechnics for pyrotechnics sake. It was just a lot of sort of uh, you know, technically impressive stuff but there wasn't much musicality involved. There wasn't a lot, a lot of artisan involved. And what he said about Coltrane was when Coltrane played even though he played in that very fast style, that very busy style. Um, he didn't mind it all because Coltrane was so, so good. Later on uh, in this year, this very same year, uh, a very influential music critic, 
by the name Ira Gibber, talked by Mr. Bain, who coins this term that's associated with Coltrane's playing, where he talks about how Coltrane played, really, even though saxophone is a, an instrument that doesn't, it's not a piano or a guitar that can play multiple notes at the same time, or you can, but it's not meant to. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and so this term is coined, it's a famous term associated with Coltrane, coined in 1959, actually, called sheets of sound. So you get these sheets of sound already that you can hear in the spring of 1959 on Time of Blue. And it's interesting to think, because Miles complains a lot about saxophone players who play too much. And so he doesn't mind it. Sketches of Spain is going to have to wait for another program, and that's all right because we've got lots of ideas for more jazz programs. Um, but in the meantime, I'd love to entertain any questions you may have, uh, especially if they pertain to George Russell's medium chromatic <laughs> concept. All right, I swear I'm done. Uh, yes, uh, one term that I often hear associated with Miles that I don't think you've mentioned is cool jazz. Yeah. Um, is this a term that you dislike? Does it not fit what's going on in Kind Blue? What about cool jazz? Cool jazz is usually dated to the very end of the 1940s and the early 1950s. And uh, the birth of the cool was a seminal album, the only one uh, that featured not a sextet, not a septet, not an octet, but a nonet. And it was a, a nonet that featured very unconventional instruments. And these, some of these instruments, um, are known for their kind of smooth timbres, not the piercing sort of quality of Charlie Parker's alto saxophone or Dizzy Gillespie's very high-pitched trumpet playing. So there are many ingredients baked into cool jazz, but one of them that you really hear on Birth of the Cool, and that's the sort of the album I would think about, especially in the context of Miles Davis's career, is you look at that album, what do you get? First of all, they recorded on the West Coast. So there's already a disparity in the East Coast, which had been associated with bebop and hard bop and this very hard driving style of music with very rapid chord changes. And there are a couple of, of bop charts on that, that uh, record, On Birth of the Cool, but if you look at the instrumentation, you've got Jerry Mulligan playing baritone saxophone. And if you ever heard of a good baritone saxophone player, um, or just a baritone saxophone in general, you know that the timbre is so silky. There is a quality to that instrument which is almost antithetical to the, to the piercing quality of Charlie Parker's alto player. That, I'm not, that's not a knock against Charlie Parker, it's just it's different. Also, Miles is playing, most of that record, he's playing flugelhorn. 
uh, which is another instrument that you know is associated with that cool jazz sound. Something which is a little bit dialed back in tempo, not as frenetic as the bebop style of the 1940s. 1951, it's on the West Coast, and you've got nine instruments, so more of a, a bigger ensemble, something closer to an orchestral sound. Uh, and these instruments that have a softer, more mellow timbre. And, and those are some of the ingredients. Uh, the cool jazz is important. And, uh, what I would say about that is that, you know, Birth of the Cool is very important for Miles Davis because it marks his acquaintance and initial collaboration with Bill Evans. Um, and, and he's going to collaborate with Bill Evans, of course, on a number of big projects, including one that I, I wanted to do with him tonight, but we don't have time because we're scheduled to stay in the studio. So, uh, yeah, cool jazz is important. It's uh, definitely a valid term. Question. Isn't the uh, <clears throat> the cool jazz, the West Coast jazz, the nomad notable because for the most part it uh, excluded the piano? Yes, that's right. Uh, if you listen to Birth and Cool, the traditional lineup in the bebop era in the 1940s was a small rhythm section comprised of drums, bass, and piano. The flagship rhythm. And then you'd have a couple of horns. And the horns would carry the tune, and then you need most of the soloists. And that was certainly the case for either Charlie Parker or Dizzy Gillespie. But you also had these really important pianists who were involved in this style. Bud Powell, for example, Thelonious Monk. And then you go out to, uh, to Birth of Cool, and all of a sudden the, the piano vanishes with a ubiquitous instrument that can both comp chords, and support for that reason. Thanks to Bud Powell especially, had emerged as this instrument that was capable of enormous expertise as a soloist, that is to say the pianist would be the soloist. Um, and, uh, and, and that also is important for Bebop. So that's another interesting thing. Yes, so yes. Question right in the front. Uh, do the charts that are performed in this Oh, sorry. Uh, do, do these charts exist, and do we know how thoroughly they were composed by Miles? I mean, were they structured, and then, I mean, I hear Bill Evans making things happen that I suppose Miles knew, or but it sounds to me as though it's collaborative. Obviously, it's collaborative, but the structure itself, is the charts around? There's a, uh, they did not read off anything that was ever <laughs> <laughs> what we call a transcription. A lot of jazz works like this. There's a great quote about Miles in the context of kind of blue. And I think the quote comes from Herbie Hancock, who, of course, was the star player with Miles in the next decade. And what Herbie said is that Miles never told people what to play. He only told them what not to play. He never told them what to play. And musicians tend to be very receptive to this because he would let them sort of stretch, their, stretch out, spread their wings, and, and find their voice. He didn't like it. He'd tell them, but he would never say, "Okay, you, and then you're going to play, uh, you know, an F sharp here, and, and uh, make sure that you end your solo, play B flat there, and emphasize the sixth scale." He, he didn't do things like that. So um, my sense is that with, you know, kind of blue was recorded at the, the famous what they called the Church, because it was a studio that was known for the Church, Church of Columbia Records, Thirty Inch Street Studio. And the story goes that they just went in there, and they had been playing the sextet, had been playing most of them, had been playing with the exception of Bill Evans, they'd been playing together for a couple of years. So you can imagine chemistry off the charts. They probably didn't, they know they didn't need many cuts, which is, by the way, very different from what we're going to talk about in our next program with um, the Time Out album, which is notorious for, um, for how long it took to, to record. And I think that had to do, to some degree, with just how adventurous and how unconventional uh, the style was on Time Out. I'll talk more about that later on. But no, we, you can imagine it was very bare bones, very skeletal in terms of construction. I think we're good, Gil. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Thanks, Gil. And I just, I just want to remind everybody, April 10, hope to see you all there. One thing I can tell you as a teaser, you will hear a couple of cuts that I can guarantee you've never heard in your whole life because they're from Dave's personal recordings of when they were making the timeout record. Right here at the Wilton Library. That's where you're going to find it.